Namo Buddhaya. Good to see you all. Bandami Bhante. Ah, good, good. Someone who knows. Sad, sad, sad. Okay. I hope everybody is doing well. Just trying to read everyone's name to know who's here. Good to see you all. Okay. So today, what is it going to be? <laughs> so we started uh, three sessions ago with the loving kindness as we did usual then we had a request for compassion and then last was joy and today um, maybe it would be a good idea to complete the Brahma Viharas and to try a radiant calm as I like to call it which is equanimity or um, boundless uh, home and to wrap up our uh, mini um, Brahma Vihara training so I thought we might uh, we might try this today and though I must say that um, equanimity or calm or mental steadiness as a practice as a uh, radiant practice like the Buddha taught uh, his uh, limitless samadhi or measureless samadhi apamana samadhi um, to radiate this quality uh, all around us we first need to be able to have it within ourselves so the tricky thing with uh, equanimity is and that's also a reason why it is mentioned last probably when the Buddha talks about the four Brahma Viharas is that it requires in itself a little bit of steadiness <laughs> or calm already and sometimes it's difficult for the mind to, uh, in fact, um, unfold this quality right away. So that's why I am suggesting that we begin with a um, little bit of a calming down and body body awareness with joy and we will begin with this tonight and then uh, about halfway in so we have a bit of joy and we can have this wonderful collectedness and a bit more steadiness of mind and then perhaps we will be able to truly practice this wonderful radiant calm in all directions and then right after I will be speaking on the Sabhasava Sutta tonight, the all of the distractions, the mastery of all distractions, because they happen in all kinds of ways. And so there's all kinds of tools to know how to deal with them. But first things first, and we can all begin by closing our eyes and bringing up a smile to the corners of our mouth and let go everything everything you are doing today any conversations that you had 
anything you were preparing for tomorrow or the next week just make some room let it go and find ease find your own comfort in your own body right now Perhaps you might start to notice that your neck is a little stiff or your shoulders, your shoulder blades in between them. Maybe some muscles in your face, your cheeks are tensed. Simply Relax. And actively dissolve that tension. Let it go. Calm down. And smile. And perhaps you might notice body. Just sitting there. Happy. In fact, this is, was one of the Buddha's instructions to one of his chief disciples was to always be devoted to the awareness, knowing the body with joy. melting away the tension slowly and feeling how good it feels and being glad about it and smiling.
the Buddha said, Panche niwarane pahine, Pamo jang jayati. As we notice the melting away of the hindrances, of the tensions, gladness naturally takes its place, naturally arises. And when we smile, we allow this gladness to come to fruition, to come to a bloom. We do not repress it, we in fact encourage it. Then he said, Pamuditasa piti jayati. From that gladness, joy arises. As the hindrances are released, relaxed, let go of, given up, the mind opens up, becomes lighter, and by this very fact becomes uplifted, happy. Then he said, Piti Manasa Kaya Pasambati. With this uplifted or oh, joyful mind, blissful mind, the body becomes calm. Kaya Pasambati. And therefore, calm brings up joy and joy brings up calm, working together. And he said, Pasada Kayo Sukang Jayati. With a calm body, with a tranquil body, meaning without tension, without stress. There comes to be sukha, happiness, or ease.
And finally, he said, Sukhi no chittang samadhyati. With this happy mind, that mind which is at ease. There comes to be samadhi, mental collectedness. The water of awareness starts gathering within the mind itself. Because it has stopped flowing outside. through each of the sense doors. And it is experiencing joy, ease and contentment. having uplifted our minds with calm and joy and collected our minds we can feel the quality of upekka Upa Ishka, steady looking, on looking, continual awareness. And we can allow it to suffuse our whole body and suffuse the entire universe with radiant calm. Boundless calm awareness. radiant stillness of heart in front of you to your right behind to your left, above and below you.
like a crisp fall sunrise. where everything is still. Quiet. Boundless, measureless in all of space, suffusing, imbuing everything, all living beings. If your mind makes up questions and starts thinking about it, let go, release that distraction. Relax. Smile. And dive back into the quality of radiant calm. Yes, the smile is still helping and appropriate. Happy equanimity. Just like at the deepest depth of the ocean, where everything is completely dampened. when there is heavy silence, heavy calm, it's 
suffusing, permeating everything. yet not forcing, only embodying the quality. Whatever your mind says, whether it's saying that you're doing it wrong or you have doubt in your mind, just let it go. It's only mind, just chattering itself. Smile and come back to the quality of radiant calm. Relax, let go. Whenever you're starting to take mind too seriously, getting involved in any kind of distractions, taking it personal, and building over the mental, mental chatter. 
Just smile, let it go. Mind is crazy sometimes. And relax and come back to the vehicle of radiant calm. Enjoying the calm, delighting in the calm. This is the topic tonight. On how to deal with all of these distractions when they arise or before they arise. And perhaps know a little bit more about how the mind works. And know how to perhaps avoid certain situations, how to develop certain other aspects. And also I chose this particular sutta, Sabha Asawa, all of the, the Asawas are usually translated as the taints or defilements. They are the flows of the mind going out to all these things, these distractions. And they happen in all kinds of ways. And there were a few questions recently about um, the lower fetters, uh, the belief in the personal self, and clinging to blind rites and rituals or practices and doubt in the practice, doubt in the Dhamma and also one of the main aspects of this practice, the beginning aspect, which is discernment and how to develop a view that is uh, straight and how to develop a view that is in line with the Dhamma, in harmony with the Dhamma. 
And the person who has a straight view, who understands how things work, Dhamma, the truth, how it is, is said to have a straight view and one who is a noble meditator, one who has entered the stream of the Dhamma. And how should one train to, how should one see in order to have a straight view, straight practice, which is very important. And this sutta begins with that. And so this is at Savati, like a lot of the suttas. And the, the Buddha is addressing the monks and he says, Monks, I will teach you the complete mastery of all distractions. Listen and, and carefully, listen carefully and apply your mind to what I will say. Yes, Bhante, the monks replied. The awakened one said this, The calming of the mental distractions, monks, is for one who is conscious and discerning, not for one who is not conscious and not discerning. By being conscious and discerning of what does the end of the distractions come to be? When there is wise attention and when there is unwise attention. And this also, this sutta is wonderful for talking about the first step of right effort, wise practice also. So there's a difference here between wise attention and unwise attention, and we'll explore this a little bit deeper. Being unwise with one's attention new distractions come to be and old distractions increase. Being wise with one's attention, new distractions do not come to be and old distractions are given up. Monks, there are distractions that should be given up by discernment, distractions that should be given up by self-mastery. Distractions that should be given up by reflection. Distractions that should be given up by endurance. Distractions that should be given up by avoiding. Distractions that should be given up by release. And distractions that should be given up by development. So see here the Buddha is giving us a quite wonderful exposition on a lot of different ways that these distractions arise and how first we can prevent them by knowing certain things, discernment, by self-mastery over the sense doors, which we'll go into later. Reflection, wisely reflecting on a few things endurance, avoiding, release, and development. So in all these ways, so there's not just one way, <laughs> but many, many ways of dealing with them. How are distractions given up by discernment? That's a good question. And that's the straight view. Here a person does not learn the Dhamma from the awakened people does not visit the does not visit the awakened people does not know nor practices the dhamma of the awakened people and this is uh, arya here which i translated as awakened does not visit the people of truth sapurisa does not know nor practices the dhamma of the people of truth in the time of the Buddha, there was spiritual practices that were basically, um, some people were behaving like dogs, 
walking on all four limbs, eating with their mouth on the ground. That was their spiritual practice. And so we can, uh, understanding that this context uh, in northern India at that time, um, there was a lot of different spiritual practices, which is something that happens today also. But the Buddha here is uh, drawing some lines where uh, what he discovered, what is the Dhamma that he discovered, and what is that view that needs to be perfected. That person is not likely to understand what things are proper for attention and what things are improper for attention. Therefore, unknowingly, one attends to the things that are improper for attention and does not attend to the things that are proper for attention. And how does one attend to the things that are improper for attention? One attends to the things which make new distractions of outward desires. and old distractions of outward desire grow. New distractions arise and old distractions grow. One attends to things that make new distractions of becoming arise and old distractions of becoming grow. And new distractions of carelessness to arise and old distractions of care carelessness to grow and these are basically see here the Buddha didn't always explain his teaching in exactly the same way every time because here we we notice it's not outward desires or and hatred and uh, delusion here he uses uh, outward desires, kama, and he uses bhava, be becoming. And this becoming is simply uh, like planning a trip, or what do you want to be when you grow old? And all these things, which seem fairly blameless from uh, the get-go from seeing them at first but these things they pile up they do not just <laughs> remain like this and pass pass away and we hold on to these ideas and we hold on to more ideas and when these ideas do not become fulfilled then there are some problems <laughs> and we become agitated and the more we become agitated, the more we're looking for other things to cling to. So, here the Buddha is explaining it with bhava, becoming. I usually say, these are all the projections in the future that we're doing. All that next thing that I will do, or I will do this and I will do that. And, I, and these things, they just actually, they never end. They, they continually keep going so <laughs> and they pile up and they do create tension and distractions and carelessness here is that as these things pile up and pile up this is avija um, then all we see is these things we do not see reality as it is anymore we see it tainted by all of these things. Oh, I want to do this, but if I do that, I'll have to I'll have to move away from that and that doesn't work. I don't want that. And then doing this is complicated, but I need to do it to do this. All of this then these impede the vision. These impede awareness and that carelessness or that lack of discernment, of lack of awareness, um, piles on and piles on. So this is how this process works. 
In this way one attends to the things that are improper for attention. They are improper because these create more distraction, create more tension within us. They are not going towards letting go, release and happiness. How does one not attend to the things that are proper for attention? One does not attend to the things which make new distractions of outward desires not to arise and old distractions of outward desires to fade away. Same thing for becoming and carelessness. And so, here, this is not attending to either the Brahma Viharas, taking a strong determination to only be in the boundless love, to only be in boundless compassion, to only be in boundless joy, to only be in boundless calm, or to look at reality with the four resting places of awareness, to rest our minds without judgments or opinions or either the body, sensations, or anything that is felt, being aware of it, but not pushing it away, not holding on to it, seeing its arising and passing away, and knowing, or perhaps the mind, or mental states. And these are the things proper for attention here. It's simply mentioned in another way. But we get the point that when we attend wisely upon either the Satipatthanas or the Brahma Viharas, then these distractions, they fade away, they, they cool down. In this way, one does not attend to the things that are, Im that are proper for attention, and one attends to the things that are improper for attention. And not attending to these things that are proper for attention, new distractions arise and old distractions multiply. So there is a piling up and they grow. That's how it works. Then one unwisely attends in this way. This is the this is all what this so far this is what not to do. So if you were wondering. <laughs> Did I exist for a long time? Did I not exist for a long time? Why did I exist all this time? For what reason did I exist in the past? Having become what? How have I existed in the past? Will I exist in the future? Will I not exist in the future? How will I exist in the future? For what reason will I exist in the future? Having become what? How will I exist in the future? Or one is perplexed regarding one's own present self. Thus, am I? Am I not? Why am I? What am I? Where has this being come from? Where will it go? Now you can wonder here perhaps why the Buddha is saying this, but all these are very wonderful ground for proliferation of the mind and blind belief, which we'll cover in a little bit. To one who attends unwisely, six views or some similar opinion take hold. And this is what the Buddha, this is the opposite of straight view. This is the crooked view. Believing in all kinds of things that are not necessarily possible to know. The belief, there is a self for me arises as undeniable truth. The belief there is not a self for me arises as undeniable truth. 
the belief self is the witness of self arises as undeniable truth. The belief no self is witness of no self arises as undeniable truth. The belief no self is witness of self arises as undeniable truth. Or else the belief I am this self who speaks and feels who is continually experiencing the result of good and bad actions and thus and thus myself is permanent steady eternal of an unchanging nature and it will stand continually in eternity monks i say that this is running after dogma thickening the dogma a wilderness of dogma the distortion of dogma a flutter of dogma the shackles of dogma Bonded by the shackles of blind beliefs, monks, that person is not liberated from rebirth, aging and death, sorrow, depression, difficulties, anxiety and uneasiness. I say that person is not liberated from trouble. See here the very uh, pragmatic, down-to-earth uh, approach of the Buddha very logical. Here a wise meditator learns the Dhamma of the awakened people, visits the awakened people, understands and practices the Dhamma of the awakened people, visit people of truth, understands and practices the Dhamma from the people of truth. That person is likely to understand what things are proper for attention and what things are improper for attention. Therefore, knowingly, one attends to the things proper for attention and does not attend to the things that are improper for attention. How does one attend to the things that are proper for attention? How does one not attend to the things that are improper for attention? Here's a little tricky, playing with words. But uh, I will go quickly through this one because uh, I think you get the gist of it. And this is repeating the new and old distractions of outward desires becoming or projection in the future and uh, carelessness to arise and grow. A person does not attend to these things. And these are the six everything that happens at the six senses. That doesn't mean that you completely stop living. That simply means that you're careful, you're aware, wise attention. And when the Buddha talks about wise attention, it's always speaking about the mind. Knowing what the mind is doing, this is what vipassana means is observing the mind. Pasana is that observation, seeing. And we, it's in that special way. That is simply knowing that famously called insight. Well, that insight is about mind. It's all related to mind. And what mind is doing? Is it clinging to everything that's happening? Is it pushing something away? Or is it simply steady in collected happiness here and now and aware? And these are the things that make all these distractions grow. And so one does not pay attention to that. One does not flow the water of their awareness into these things. They protect it. In this way, one does not attend to the things that are improper for attention. How does one attend to the things that are proper for attention? One attends to the things that make new distractions of outward desires not to arise. 
and old distractions of outward desires to fade away. And this again, th these are the Brahma Viharas and the four resting places of awareness because they are truly wholesome. They are detached from all these fields of mental proliferations. When we practice the Brahma Viharas in this radiant, boundless way, what happens in the mind is that it has this quality of being completely open. And therefore, there is not, there's not one opening for the mind to flow towards the senses or to, um, or to become angry at something. Because as soon as that happens, then there is no more of that quality. Or it is not completely boundless and immeasurable, like the Buddha so skillfully explains it so many times and similarly for the projecting in the future and the lack of discernment this is how and also this lack of discernment can also be seen as restlessness in a very tangible way here and now in the meditation practice this is how one attends to the things that are proper for attention Thus, not attending to the things that are improper for attention and attending to the things that are proper for attention. New distractions do not come to be and old distractions fade away. And this is also the first step of right effort, wise practice. Now, how does the Buddha tell us to attend on life and on reality. He says, one wisely attends to things knowing this is tension. One wisely attends to things knowing this is the increase of tension. One wisely attends to the things to things knowing this is the release from tension. One wisely attends to, the thing, to things knowing this is the way to release the tension. These are the four awakened understandings, obviously, the noble truths. And the Buddha here explains once again his very pragmatic, down-to-earth, straight view <laughs> that he taught that if we keep these four things in mind constantly, we will continually move towards Nibbana. And when we see that tension arises in the mind, in the body, we will let it go. We are likely to, when we see the first noble truth, the second noble truth, we are likely to develop the third noble truth and to develop the fourth noble truth. Therefore, this keeps us on the path. And this first noble truth of tension and the origin of tension, when we see them, the more we train into seeing them with everything, the more we practice, the more faith arises, confidence. Because we see in many different ways that Certain things are causing us tension, and certain things are causing us to be happy, to be content, here and now. And that is the Eightfold Path, and that is the release. Attending in such a wise way, three bonds or three fetters fade away. Belief in the personal self, doubt about the Dhamma or the teaching, and blind beliefs in um, blind practices and uh, adherence to blind practices and observances, rites and rituals. Sila Bhatta Paramasa. And now we can see in this way where the Buddha is going. And so it's not 
it's not uh, thinking in all kinds of ways that we understand the Buddha's teaching. It's a very specific um, way of understanding reality. And a lot of times there are questions about the three fetters. And this is obviously denoting someone who is entering the stream, because that is usually uh, what the Buddha said uh, to about one who entered the stream, is that these three these three fetters that fetter the mind into lower states are given up by someone with right view. And so the first one, belief in the personal self. Now this is not uh, becoming an arahant and knowing uh, continually uh, the impersonal nature of reality. But at this level, usually the Buddha would also describe stream entry as someone would see the Dhamma, would plunge into the Dhamma, dive into the Dhamma, and would become very confident about the Buddha's teaching, about the Buddha, and the, the Sangha, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. Because once the Dhamma is understood, then one can understand the awakening of the Buddha. That emerges naturally. And when that emerges naturally also, then there is understanding, yes, the Sangha or everybody that is practicing this path are practicing the right way, the good way, the straight way. The meaningful way. Why? Because there's no dogma. There is just knowing things for what they are here and now. Yatabu tang pajanati. Here, this is tension, this is its cause, this is happiness, this is its cause. And one thing that happens when we hear talks, and this is part of straightening the view, is attending to going to discussions on the Dhamma, knowing and how the Buddha mentions wise friendship, beautiful friendship, right at the beginning of this very sutta. One visits people that know a little bit about it. <laughs> and so one can understand what really the Buddha was talking about. And then one gets to soon enough, sooner or later, with interest and visiting people or reading books or about it and w the gradually there is an understanding that starts to grow and one starts to understand that there is no ground for claiming a self in anything and that the Buddha extolled or exposed in many ways. But we can very easily see it here and now as we sit in meditation. When we sit and, for example, we might wish, let my mind have no distractions at all right here and now and enter Nibbana. Does it happen? No. <laughs> and right there and then, we can see just a glimpse of what the Buddha was talking about. We might wish, I might wish, let my arm become bigger, longer, but it's not happening. I might wish my hair to be longer, but it's not, well, it's happening, but uh, slowly. And I cannot tell it to be this long right now. And um, and in so many ways, we start to understand 
intellectually but also experientially we have enough we build up enough understanding of it that we there is a point where we cannot believe in a personal self anymore and this in fact is a ground for a lot of hindrances that just falls out the bottom falls out now it doesn't mean that you become an arahant that that means that because the the seventh or the eighth fetter the higher fetter mana conceit will still be there until arahantship and that conceit is that pride that I-ness, that minus, that me, myself, I. It stays for much longer, but at least there is a point when we get to understand that there is no self. It is impersonal. And that every time that we let go of a hindrance, every time we let go of a distraction which is which is either liking or disliking it's either wanting or not wanting we let go of the belief in the personal self because this wanting what comes first I <laughs> this dislike I. I want. I don't want. Therefore, all of these things are rooted in this I. And therefore, when we start understanding this, this is quite profound. And when we start understanding these mental distractions, for example, when we sit, uh, there is a way of developing the mind in which we let go, we do not take it personal, we do not feed our awareness in the distractions, we simply let go, smile, and relax, and continue developing whichever vehicle of awareness we were developing, or resting our awareness onto either one of the satipatthanas. And in this way, we become seamless, seamless awareness. And there is not there is not one place where where this I can come in, I, and it is let go constantly, and we can in fact at that point experience much more freedom. And this is the beauty of the Buddha's teaching. See how all these questions were tormenting our minds before: Who am I? Where have I come from? And all these questions that are in fact very hard to answer and can keep us questioning for a very long time. Here the Buddha cuts it straight and says, you cannot know these things. <laughs> and you should attend wisely knowing, see, you think that's you, but are you really in control? Are you really in control of your mind right here and now? Oh. Can you tell it to stop being distracted? No. Can you start flying with your body? No, not really. Not right now, anyways. And also, this is directly related to experiencing happiness. The Buddha said, that if this was really yourself, there would never be any pain. If you had control, full control over this thing you, we call a self, there would never be the coming upon hurt there would never be harm, there would never be violence, there would never be pain, there would be never any kind of trouble. Why? Because nobody's, nobody would do that to themselves. Nobody would choose 
oh, I haven't felt terrible for a long time. I should do it now. No, that's not how it works. <laughs> but still, we come upon difficulties, we come upon trouble. And so this is also a wonderful way we can understand this. Now I'm getting a little carried away here. But doubt is doubt in the teaching. This is not doubt about whether you should use a nail or a screw. It's about doubt about how things work. It's about how knowing that straight view, having that straight view. And when that straight view arises, that is the Eightfold Path, then the crooked doubt is straightened out and there is no more doubt. Therefore, when someone enters the Dhamma, understand the Dhamma, the Eightfold Path, this wise, through wise discernment we can see and wise intention, wise attitude arises, wise speech, wise actions, wise livelihood, wise practice, wise awareness, wise meditation. And these things, when they become solidly uh, implemented into our lives, into our understanding, this is the straight view. And now we can turn the wheel of Dhamma. And as we know this, as we understand this, and as we see it so clearly, then blind practices fall away. Because we see, for example, there was a practice of going and uh, ritual bathing in, in any kind of holy body of water. And people thought that at that time that it was uh, washing away your sins or washing away the evil actions that you could have done. But with this understanding, we clearly see that someone who has committed assault on somebody, who has murdered somebody, who goes to any kind of body of water, when he comes out or she comes out, when that person comes out, that person is still the same. <laughs> still has hurt, has murdered. It doesn't wash away these actions. What washes away the actions is that path, is the, the eight-spoke path of the awakened. And that is how we understand the coming out of these actions, the stopping of these actions, and the performing of wholesome actions. And these are the three fetters that are abandoned right away with the arising of view, with seeing the Dhamma, seeing the Eightfold Path, how it works with the spotless uh, eye vision of the Dhamma. These things fall away. And there is great confidence that arises. Usually people, how the Buddha said it, they, he said that people acquired confidence without the help of another in the teaching, in the Dhamma. Having attained that view by themselves. And see that is another beautiful aspect of this, is that a person can speak about the Dhamma, but it always, the power is always within each individual's hands and what they do. And when that vision of the Dhamma arises, then that person does not have to be told, they understand. <laughs> it's not something that uh, they, uh, they have been forced upon. It comes by understanding, by their own understanding. Okay, 
This is how distractions are given up by discernment. I promise the other ones are faster. How are distractions given up by self-mastery? Reflecting wisely one practices, guarded by the mastery of the seeing faculty. Because, of one, because if one were to practice, unguarded by the mastery of the seeing faculty, this would bring up tension and overwhelming distractions in one's mind. See, this is the first step of wise practice again, right effort which is always accompanied by wise awareness. We need the awareness to be aware of these things that might arise. So it is directing our awareness wisely and using it for our practice. So it is a wheel. Therefore one practices guarded by the mastery of the seeing faculty. In this way tension and overwhelming distractions do not manifest. Reflecting wisely, one practices guarded by the mastery of the hearing faculty. This is maybe having a song in your head or, you know, doing this thing and uh, not paying attention and banging your head on something or your toe on something. And that is the direct effect of, of this. And... Um, an example to understand a little bit more about uh, these faculties and how how to guard them how to understand to be aware um, at each of these senses because if one were to practice unguarded by the mastery of the hearing faculty this would bring up tension and overwhelming distractions when you have this song looping in the mind. Sometimes we we indulge so much in it you can feel tension arising, arising, arising. But if there's no awareness, if there's not this practice of self-mastery, then there is not that seeing, there is not that noticing, that recognizing, that knowing. This would bring up tension and overwhelming distractions. Therefore, one practices guarded by the mastery of the hearing faculty. In this way, tension and overwhelming distractions do not manifest. Reflecting wisely, one practices guarded by the mastery of the smelling faculty. Because if one were to practice unguarded by the mastery of the smelling faculty, this would bring up tension and overwhelming distractions in one's mind. This you can see that when you go maybe at, um, in a dumpster and uh, with someone that's not really used to going to a dumpster. And um, there's really that strong smell. And if we do not make sure that we are master over our own minds, that we are aware of the state of our mind we can easily see when someone loses awareness over a smell for example a very sharp strong unpleasant smell that's one way we can see this and so there is proliferation there is judgment oh i don't like this smell oh why is it why are we here what are we doing here and all these things that are coming up in the mind and that person becomes very contracted very almost black in the face then we can see directly how nibbana is happiness in this way tension and overwhelming distractions do not manifest Reflecting wisely, one practices guarded by the mastery of, of the tasting faculty. Because if one were to practice unguarded by the mastery of the tasting faculty, this would bring up tension and overwhelming distractions in the mind. 
Therefore, one practices guarded by the mastery of the tasting faculty. And this is a very interesting one as well. And you can do this when uh, three times a day or two times a day or one time a day, depending on how many times a day you eat. But uh, to notice what the mind is doing while eating. Is it really fully aware all the time and not creating any judgment about, oh, I like this food, or, oh, I really don't like this food, oh, this, oh, that, and then, oh, I remember I ate this at that point and that's what happened after that. And then next thing we know, we're not really paying attention to the food and the plate. We're just somewhere else in, in the memory. And uh, it's quite interesting how these distractions, in fact, arise quite strongly, um, especially while eating. And so this is what the Buddha said. This is that tasting faculty. Uh, making sure that we're master of our own mind, not mastered by our own minds. Victims. Therefore, one practices guarded by the mastery of the tasting faculty. In this way, tension and overwhelming distractions do not manifest. Reflecting wisely, one practices guarded by the mastery of the touching faculty. Because if one were to practice unguarded by the mastery of the touching faculty, this would bring up tension and overwhelming distractions in the mind. Now maybe we had a song in our head and while we were eating something and there's this really heavy stench in wherever we are and the mind is just really overwhelmed by all these things, multitasking. And then we come upon uh, a hot pan and we put the hand right on the hot pan. And then there is that touch, really painful touching feeling. Well, at this point, we're already far away from awareness. <laughs> but this is also to demonstrate how these things could happen. And this, then this unpleasant touch if we are not already aware it is surprising it is it it comes as a shock and that's the double edge of this is that first we are not paying attention then this allows ground for unpleasant things to happen but also when unpleasant things are happening then it is shocking because we're not aware, we're not paying attention at all. So it is even more provocative. Therefore, um, that's how this tension and overwhelming distraction could very quickly arise in a hand that is getting burned by a hot pan. And I'm sure you can imagine this. Therefore, one practices guarded by the mastery of the touching faculty. So that doesn't mean not touching anything. That means being aware of the things that are being touched and being aware uh, that the mind does not create any judgments, opinions, uh, tension over it. In this way, tension and overwhelming distractions do not become manifest. Reflecting wisely, one practices guarded by the mastery of the thinking faculty. Here the Buddha isn't giving us much ground. Because if one were to practice unguarded by the mastery of the thinking faculty, this would bring up tension and overwhelming distractions in one's mind. And this is all of these things that have been happening at each of the sense doors, maybe proliferating about it, thinking about this and that, your next trip or what happened yesterday, this person, that person, the next retreat, anything. And the mind is simply 
not aware of itself anymore. It is lost in thought. It is completely lost in thinking, thinking, thinking. Papancha, papancha, the Buddha called it propagation, proliferation. And so this mind is also a sense faculty. Because if one were to practice unguarded by the mastery of the thinking faculty, this would bring up tension and overwhelming distractions in one's mind. Therefore, one practices guarded by the mastery of the thinking faculty. In this way, tension and overwhelming distractions do not manifest. In this way, when one practices unguarded by self-mastery, tension and overwhelming distractions come to be. But when one practices guarded by the self-mastery, tension and overwhelming distractions do not come to be. And how are distractions given up by reflection? And here we have the reflection on the four requisites of life that the monks... Of course, this is a discourse delivered to monks, like, like most of the Buddha's discourses. But it is very wonderful knowledge to have for anybody because whether you're a monk or whoever you are, this is how it works and this is how the distractions happen. But there are these four things that we need for life, basic for life, to live in comfort and to have an easy life, not, an, not a luxurious life, but just enough that we can live at ease and practice mental development and cultivate an uplifted, happy mind and meditation. And these things are food, shelter, clothing and medicine. And here this is something that the monks are to, uh, taught to reflect upon every day in this particular way. While wearing robes, one reflects wisely, or any clothing. This is only to protect this body from cold, to protect it from the heat, to protect it from flies, mosquitoes, wind, sun, insects, and lurking animals. This is only for covering the private parts. Very essential, pragmatic. While eating alms food, one reflects wisely, or any food. This is not for playing around, not for intoxication, not for looking pretty, not for personal pride. This is only for sustaining and maintaining the body, for allaying this discomfort, for the love of the spiritual life. In this way, I will appease any overwhelming feelings of hunger and will create and will not create any new feelings of overeating. In this way, I will become blameless and live at ease. And see here, one can reflect if if one is not thinking about it in this way, then what is one thinking about? <laughs> Interesting. While living in some residence, one reflects wisely. This is only to shelter from the cold, to shelter from the heat, to protect from flies, mosquitoes, wind, sun, insects, and lurking animals. This is only to ease the disturbances of the seasons and for the purpose of meditation or wholesome mental development or what could be called being happy, content here and now. While using medicine for illnesses and medical assistance or treatments, one reflects wisely, this is only to relieve any arisen, hurtful, oppressive feelings in the service of the highest kindness of heart. 
and here this is why why is this is because we can see that in a few in few occasions when the medicine has become more than just the medicine the medicine isn't really needed anymore but it's being used for all kinds of reason all kinds of things the best medicine is in fact not to need medicine anymore <laughs> medicine is when we are sick and we use it to become healthy but when that medicine becomes a ground for the mind to proliferate into other things then then it loses its primary means this primary meaning in this way when one re when one is unreflective tension and overwhelming distractions come to be but when one is reflective tension and overwhelming distractions do not come to be so see here when we have this view when we think about these things in that way there is no attachment there's no judgment there's no opinion there's only using these to support a very wholesome healthy lifestyle of contentment and mental development how are the distractions given up by endurance reflecting wisely one patiently bears with heat and cold hunger and thirst flies mosquitoes wind sun insects lurking animals ways of speech that are hurtful and unwelcomed and experienced bodily feelings that are painful sharp burning severe disagreeable repulsive and life-threatening that doesn't mean that this is our spiritual practice that simply means that we learn to understand that when these things arise they arise they are the truth of that moment whether we beat ourselves up or whether we scream whether we shout whether we do all these things it's not going to change that it hurts therefore we can just accept and let it go and see it as it is we don't we're not trying to cultivate the pain but when it comes we are forbearing forgiving and we let it go we accept it one is forbearing in nature in this way when one is not forbearing tension and overwhelming distractions would come to be but when one is forbearing tension and overwhelming distractions do not come to be this is how distractions are given up by endurance how are distractions given up by avoiding reflecting wisely just as someone would avoid a mad elephant a mad horse a mad bull a mad dog a mad a snake a stump a thorny bush a hole a steep cliff a cesspool a sewage spill similarly one avoids an unsuitable location and associating with those people who are bent on harm and any action which wise brothers and sisters in the spiritual life would recognize as harmful behavior therefore reflecting wisely one avoids unsuitable locations and people bent on harm this simply means if you stand in the middle of the traffic downtown big city this will create distractions in your mind therefore don't stand there it's also being smart about our general location and general association with certain people some people say well it's not really nice that you're saying compassion and love for all living beings but you're pushing away certain kind of people 
saying that you shouldn't associate or just associate with the wise, then what about these other ones? Well, this is not really understanding that to the extreme, if you associate with murderers, it's not going to be for your welfare and benefit in the long run. It doesn't mean that we hate them, we have compassion for them, but that doesn't mean that you should go and spend time with them. <laughs> and hopefully they fall into a place where they meet with goodness, when they have the good opportunity to change and to be received with uh, care and compassion and love and they can change. And maybe you can be that person from the outside. But directly seeking association with certain kinds of people is not wise. It's getting yourself in trouble in the first place. In this way, when one does not avoid tension and overwhelming distraction come to be, but when one avoids tension and overwhelming distractions do not come to be. How are distractions given up, given up by release? reflecting wisely and this is about the letting go this is um, one of the places where we can find a very uh, wonderful and uh, quite extensive explanation of release that uh, that very important aspect of our practice when a thought of outward desire come up, one does not continue along with it. One abandons it, releases it, lets it go, undoes it, and brings them to an end. And this is uh, quite a wonderful sequence. This is Nadi Vasati, Pajahati, Vinodati, Bhyankaroti, Anabhavangameti. And so this is really teaching us about the Third Noble Truth in action. And the Third Noble Truth that we saw earlier was Asesa Viraga Niroda, Chaga Patinisaga, Mutti Analaya. And that's calming down, bringing it to an end. Chaga, giving it away completely Asesa, without reminder. Patini Saga, breaking free from it. Mutti, release, freedom from it. And Analaya, not latching on. And these are all wonderful terms that the Buddha used to explicitly tell us about the release part of the teaching, which is very important to understand. And he, in fact, used many words. We only have to know where to find them. When a thought of anger comes up, one does not continue along with it. One abandons it, releases it, lets it go. One undoes it and brings it to an end. When the thought of harm or restlessness comes up, one does not continue along with it. One abandons it, releases it, lets it go, undoes it and brings it to an end. One after the other, when the harmful, unwholesome states come up, one does not continue along with them. One abandons them, releases them, lets them go. One undoes it and lets them unwind until they end. In this way, when one does not release, Tension and overwhelming distractions come to be. But when one releases, tension and overwhelming distractions do not come to be. This is how distractions are given up by release. See how here we were speaking of more, we began with 
straightening our view and we saw many ways through which we saw described wise awareness and wise practice but now we are really falling into closer and closer towards the actual act of sitting meditation and you might wonder where is the joy in all of this well this is the last step when we will be speaking about development and how are distractions given up by development why reflecting wisely one develops the support of awakening of awareness which is caused by letting go not holding releasing and culminates in relaxing one develops the support of awakening of discernment of states which is caused by letting go not holding releasing and relaxing see here the releasing relaxing comes back again not holding letting go viveka nisittang niroda nisittang viraga nisittang and vosaga parinaming this is the the actual words of the buddha one develops the support of awakening of inspired practice or inspiration or motivation often called energy which is caused by letting go not holding releasing and relaxing one develops the support of awakening of joy which is caused by letting go not holding releasing and relaxing and here this joy here the buddha is so clearly so clearly saying that it needs to be developed it needs to be cultivated it is in the seven supports of awakening and it is extremely important because with the joy comes calm and with calm comes joy that release that we previously saw that is the discerning the telling states apart which is the second awakening support and doing this repeatedly with inspiration inspired practice we really get to experience joy release the joy of release and with the joy we can release and calm further and it is very important to understand this and to understand it is a pivotal point a pivotal aspect of the practice very central one develops the support of awakening of calm which is caused by letting go not holding releasing and relaxing one develops the support of awakening of collected mental harmony which is caused by letting go not holding releasing and relaxing one develops the support of awakening of steadiness of mind which is caused by letting go not holding releasing and relaxing in this way when one does not develop the mind tension and overwhelming distractions come to be but when one develops the mind tension and overwhelming distractions do not come to be this is how distractions are given up by development and through this development we have the awareness to see and practice everything else that came before this monks when one has given up the distractions to be given up by discernment who has given up the distractions to be given up by self mastery the distractions to be given up by reflection the distractions to be given up by endurance the distractions to be given up by avoiding the distractions to be given up by release and the distractions to be given up by development one is called a person who lives protected by the mastery of all distractions who has cut away tension flung off the the, sh the shackles 
perfectly gone beyond arrogance, who has made an end of trouble. This is what the Awakened One said. Glad at heart, the monks rejoiced in the Awakened One's words. And so this is how the Buddha taught all these many ways that these things we call distractions or hindrances, how they come up, the situation that they come up, and all these ways that they arise and they grow strong and they pile up, and all these ways to see that, and by seeing that we can be wise and let go of them and experience greater freedom of mind which directly correlates with happiness. And so I hope this was helpful to you and I would open up the some time for questions if there are any. Did everybody become Arahants? Hello, I'm Susan. I, I raised oh. my, my oh. blue hand. Uh, oh, okay. I, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. So, after such a wonderful, long discourse, um, what is the one takeaway? The that one? You think of? What is the one, just, you know, in a nutshell? In a nutshell, yes. Good question. <laughs> this particular sutta comes back with Vigata Parilaha, two words that are uh, Vigata is like uh, grasping, taking, which I've been translating as tension. And this, at the core of the teaching, these mental distractions and bodily tension, they come hand in hand all the time. When there is a distraction in the mind, there is tension somewhere. Whether it's gross in the body or whether it's just felt in the mind more, there is always this tension arising. And therefore, we saw all these different ways that these distractions arise. But if we boil it down to one thing, tension, bodily and mental tension. When we see this, we see the first noble truth. And when we see that tension, we can let it go. Mm. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Good. <laughs> and smile. And smile, yes, of course. <laughs> I was trying to keep it very, very short here. So, um, of course, there's a few things that could be said, but uh, yes, smiling. And whatever your um, vehicle of awareness is, whether you are with the metta or the compassion or joy or equanimity or uh, the still mind or any of the satipatthanas, smiling, joy, this will help you, in fact, see the tension. <laughs> thank, thank you for yes. boiling it down. Yes, my pleasure. Yes. May I ask a question? Yes, yes. Uh, just how does one, just how does one release and relax? I think I have to re listen to all that you have said many times before I can even ask such a question. But still, if 
uh, as you said, in a takeaway, in a way, can we just say one small thing about it? Just how to release and relax. How to release and relax. Yes, of course, that's a very, very good question. Well, if you take your fist like this and you hold it really tight like this and you force and then release it like that, what happens? The tension went. Yes. Then there is that tension and there is discomfort a little bit. And as we see this, we notice it's cramped. It's actually not very pleasant. And we just let it go. And we experience here and now release. And this can be anywhere in your body. As soon as you notice, there is maybe uh, tension somewhere in your body, in your neck, or... Uh, it depends. Some people are more inclined. They see it more mentally. They see more distractions than the tension. They see it more as a mental contraction. Some other people is more bodily. Everybody is a bit different. But as soon as it is seen, it's like exhaling, letting it go. Yes. One thing? Yes. Thank you. There's a question if you could repeat what's the name of the sutta that you were reading? Please. Yes. This is uh, Sabha Sawa. This is Majmanikaya 2. All of the distractions, the middling sayings of the Buddha. Oh, so that's what these little things are. Yes. I didn't see there was a chat at the bottom. (laughs) Okay. So, yes, and that's available on the the website, of course, this very translation. Okay, well, let's share our merits. And, oh, yes. So how should we, uh, how should we uh, attack to the, to the pen system? How should, yes. How should we attend? Yeah, could you elaborate on this? Yes. Yes, so all, all of these senses are uh, happening constantly, right, all the time. There's not much we can do about it. In fact, they're just there. Though we can skillfully develop awareness, awareness that is open that is accepting, and that is not focusing on any particular one, but simply accepting reality as it comes. Sometimes there might be more a predominant touching sensation. Sometimes there might be a predominant hearing sensation. Sometimes there might be predominant smell or whatever it may be. The important is that we remain within awareness. And that means making sure that we are not grasping, grasping at the experience or pushing it away. But the experience rather is happening, yata bhutang, as it is, without having an opinion without having a judgment, without criticizing it, but accepting it, welcoming it for the better or for the worse, whether it's a good or a bad experience, and simply staying 
with a steady mind, a, a joyful, steady awareness with whatever vehicle of meditation that you are cultivating at this point. Good. Sad, sad, sad. Good. Okay. Let's share our merits. Dukkha patta chani dukkha bhaya patta chani bhaya soka patta chani soka hantu sabbe pipani no idang no punyang sabba satta nu modantu sabba sampatti siddhiya akasatta cha bhumatta devanaga mahidika punyang tanga nu moditwa Chirang rakantu Buddha sasanang. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, Share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadi, sadi, sadi.